morning, everybody. Uh, I want to thank Freemind for the, hey Matt, for the opportunity to uh, uh, be able to come here and speak at this uh, important conference. So uh, again, as I mentioned, I'm the acting director of BARDA's Division of Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Medical Countermeasures. What does that mean? Uh, it means my job is to help uh, keep America safe and to save lives and protect the American way of life. And drilling down a little bit, that means that my job is to make sure that we're partnering with industry in a really smart way uh, to help us bring about the products that are necessary uh, to protect the American public from all sorts of uh, existential threats uh, to our national security and to our well-being. And these threats are real. Uh, the ones I'm going to focus most about today are the ones for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats, and I'll talk more about those in a minute. But BARDA's remit goes well beyond that. It goes to uh, pandemic influenza, uh, antibiotic resistance, as well as emerging infectious diseases. And, you know, in, in looking at this slide and looking at the various kind of articles and diagrams that were put up, I mean, it's like something happens about every two to three years, right? And you know, if you would have asked me four years ago if I thought that there was going to be an arbovirus that caused congenital birth defects, I would have said, you gotta be kidding me. And if you would have asked me five years ago if uh, Dallas was gonna have cases of Ebola, I would have said, again, you've gotta be kidding me. But you know, we, we find ourselves uh, in an unusual time where um, these kind of threats are, are, are real and that they are constantly emerging and re-emerging. So we bring about the BARDA model. And so what, what does that mean? It means we don't just give money to companies. That's an important component of what we do, obviously. But we actually bring to bear a number of different capabilities in the way that we partner with companies to ensure that they're positioned for success. Uh, we're lucky and fortunate that we've been able to retain uh, individuals on our staff with 20 or 30 years of pharmaceutical development experience. Uh, and they provide consultative services, advisory services to the companies that we support. The large companies say it, says it keeps them honest and keeps them on their game. Uh, the small companies say, thank you, I just got eight free consultants. And uh, it works really well at providing kind of a back and forth and a collaborative environment on the programs that we support and helps position those programs uh, for success. We also have a set of, of different core services and infrastructures where if somebody needed product manufactured, if you needed a clinical study done, if you needed a non-clinical study done to generate perhaps some proof of concept data in an animal model, uh, those are all services that uh, our partners have at their disposal to uh, move those products forward. And again, our focus largely is on advanced research and development, so we're picking up things typically in late stage preclinical development, maybe early clinical development, and seeing those products through licensure and approval. And then for some products, they transition to something called Project BioShield, which currently is that $2.8 billion fund uh, that was referred to in my bio. And we use that to do late stage development uh, and what we call in procurement and stockpiling of products uh, to ensure that, again, the American public has a capacity uh, to, to be able to respond to these events uh, should they occur. So in fiscal year 17, uh, in total, so the $2.8 billion fund is divided over five years. That's something we actually would like to change. So if you'd like to go talk to, the, your, to your congressman, please do that. But uh, for fiscal year 17, we were out, appropriated $1.5 billion. You can see the break of, out of that there. It was about 530 in Project BioShield, about 452 million uh, in our advanced research and development program. Again, we use our advanced research and development funds to de-risk programs for transition into Project BioShield. Uh, we were still dealing with a little bit of the Ebola supplemental funding, uh, which is, if I might jump into an aside, you also will see that we received $262 million for Zika. Here's my aside. Uh, responding to an emerging infectious disease event is not something that is easily done or responsibly done uh, with supplemental funding from Congress. What do I mean by that? That if we actually had a few hundred million dollars a year to help prepare for these events, 
that might be a better approach than spending $9 billion responding to these events in an emergency, which is currently the way I find ourselves in. It represents a number of different challenges. We get a huge influx of money to try to respond to these events. We've got to make investments in companies without any guarantee in the out years that they're going to have money that's uh, going to be able to continue their development programs. We ran into that specifically with our Zika vaccine program. And so we'd hope to try to move to a more kind of thoughtful and pragmatic approach to trying to prepare for emerging infectious disease events, but we recognize that that's a hard political fight these days. And again, we also received $268 million in our pandemic influenza program. That's largely dedicated to building out uh, vaccine manufacturing capacity. Uh, there's a specific set of market failures that have occurred in influenza vaccine production. Uh, vaccine manufacturers typically only want to make enough for the seasonal market. So when we have a totally brand new virus that no one's seen before, uh, we don't have the manufacturing capacity to respond. Since 2009, though, we've been able to establish manufacture that would allow for the production of 50 million doses of an influenza vaccine within the six months of the detection of a pandemic virus. An important capability that also needs to be maintained, and that requires financial support. So these are all the companies that, we've, that we have partnered with since our inception in 2006. So we, you know, again, we're a young federal agency. We've only been around for about 11 years. I think they were the closest thing to a startup that ha exists in the federal government. Uh, but you know, maybe, one of, maybe one of your company's uh, logos can be on this chart one day. I think we would certainly welcome that. And again, you know, our partnership with industry is our bread and butter. It is, it is what makes our organization successful. It is without you and without your company's support uh, and willingness to make these products and develop them in partnership with us, we would, we would not have the successes that we had. So I want to first just extend my thanks to all of you for, for your willingness to try to uh, participate and partner with us. We also have an extensive uh, kind of roster of federal government partners. Uh, these include the obvious ones like NIH and FDA and CDC and Department of Defense. Uh, but you know, I'll just highlight this last year we initiated a collaboration with NASA, uh, which is actually pretty interesting because we have a program that's dealing with developing medical countermeasures for the effects of radiation that would occur after a dirty bomb or a nuclear device. Well, when you send an astronaut into space, they are no longer shielded by the ozone layer and things of that nature, so they are exposed to low-level doses of, of radiation, for, especially for extended space flights. So we are collaborating with NASA and sharing our data that we've generated in animal models for medical countermeasures, and they're now contemplating actually taking some of our medical countermeasures and deploying them for longer duration human space flight, which I think is, is kind of cool, right? So uh, since our inception in 2006, we've gotten 35 products, FDA approved license or cleared. I think that's pound for pound, uh, as good as any medium-sized pharmaceutical company. Uh, and it's a record that we're quite proud of. Uh, many of these approvals have been in the pandemic influenza space, li licensing new and novel influenza vaccines. Uh, we've gotten a few diagnostic assays cleared and, and now have gotten six products uh, FDA approved uh, in the uh, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear space. And we also, as I'll talk about in a few moments, got our first uh, novel antibiotic approved uh, in 2017, which is also a significant accomplishment for that program. Kind of drilling down a little bit to the area that I'm responsible for in the organization, which is our, our CBRN portfolio. You know, I think it's funny, you know, just in the last two years, if you look at all of these different pictures, uh, these are all incidences of that, uh, where a, an agent for which we have something called a material threat determination. This is something that's issued by the Homeland Security that says, these things are really bad and they affect our, uh, or they're gonna impact our national security. We've had five incidences where those agents have been used in the last two years. Uh, where there's first the threat of uh, nuclear war from, agent, from the uh, Kim Jong-un regime in North Korea. Uh, there was a report two weeks ago that he was actively loading uh, anthrax spores into uh, ICBM missiles that would have the capability of reaching the U.S. Uh, there is uh, the two assassins that, uh, that went after his half-brother in the Malaysian airport with, a, with VX nerve gas and was used that as an, as an assassination tool. Uh, the Assad regime, in, in all of its brutality, has elected to use both chlorine uh, as well as sarin nerve gas against its own population. And then just recently in Uganda, we had an outbreak of, of Marburg virus. And so uh, we live in interesting times, and, and these are times in which we need to make sure that we are uh, sufficiently and adequately prepared to be able to respond to these events. 
And so this is kind of a, a wheel illustration of where we stand on that front uh, since 2006. And you know, each one of these pie slices of the wheel represents a different threat for which we have one of these material threat determinations issued. And for things like anthrax, we, we, we're, we're doing pretty good. We've got you know, a vaccine in quantity stockpiled to vaccinate millions of people. We've got multiple different antibiotics stockpiled. We've uh, gotten FDA approved three different antitoxin products to treat uh, late stage infection where the toxemia is present and antibiotics would no longer be effective. Uh, for things like smallpox, we've got uh, enough vaccine to, to vaccinate every healthy individual. We've also stockpiled a vaccine for immunocompromised individuals or individuals with atopic dermatitis to be able to respond for special populations. And we've also stockpiled a antiviral uh, that just recently this year submitted a new drug application to the FDA that hopefully we're anticipating approval in 2018 for a first novel chemical entity approved under the animal rule for, to treat a virus that no longer exists. Uh, which was an interesting regulatory path, uh, but we're hopeful. And uh, you know, for, but for a lot of these and for radiation, uh, five years ago, we had no capability to respond to an event involving a nuclear blast. Uh, we've now stockpiled, or in the process of stockpiling, uh, biodosimetry devices that take gene and protein expression measurements and can differentiate populations of who has received greater than two gray of radiation or who has received less. And that's going to dictate you know, whether we send somebody who's just a worried well home or whether we triage them to the tent or you know, in certain instances triage them to, I don't think there's much we can do for you, unfortunately. Uh, and we've also stockpiled uh, uh, leukine, uh, nulasta, and nupagen, which are nulasta, or nupa, nulasta is the one recently on the commercial. It's the lady that doesn't have to go back to the hospital after taking chemotherapy because she's got her little thing that's on her arm. And uh, those are all cytokines that reverse the neutropenia that's occurred from the initial stages uh, of, of, of acute ionizing radiation exposure. You lose your white blood cells. And so one of the things we want to do is prevent that. And we've leveraged off of the oncology market to be able to do that. The areas you see in red, and I'll go through some of these other ones in a little bit more detail, but the area you see in red are the areas that keep me up at night. And these are the areas where we have nothing. So for chlorine that Assad used, we have nothing. Uh, for some of the nerve agents, you know, we really don't have much. For Sudan, for Marburg, we have nothing. And so uh, I'm going to lay out to you in the next few slides what our priorities are. And, uh, and, and hopefully I'd like to turn some of those red pie slices uh, back to white with some, with some things in them. Uh, so the goal for our division uh, that I've set forth for my team is to have at least one thing for 80% of those pie slices uh, by 2023. And I'd like to get to a point uh, where I, I say that the law of diminishing returns begins to apply. So for anthrax, you know, we have all these things, right? So me going and spending $400 million developing a new thing uh, doesn't probably get us that much. And so I'd like to get to a point where for most of the things, we've reached that point. And so that further investment or we can move on to other things that also pose a threat to us uh, and make more significant investments in those spaces. A lot of these things, though, there's still operational gaps, operational gaps in how we would use these products, operational gaps more specifically in how we would sustain these products. These things all cost money. And if companies can't rely on the fact that when we're going to rebuy these things, then they're not going to make these things. And that's a failure for everybody involved. Uh, but anything that allows us to have increased shelf life, uh, lower, lower doses in terms of particularly biologics, uh, are all things we're interested in entertaining because uh, lowering costs allows us to, to do more with the, with the finite resources that we have. So Project BioShield, this is not an FDA approval, but this is products that we have incorporated into this late stage development and procurement. Uh, we have now uh, done 12, 27 products uh, and, and counting. Uh, there'll be a couple more this year as well that we're particularly interested in bringing on. Uh, in FY17, just as a highlight, uh, we uh, brought on two uh, monoclonal-based cocktails for Ebola, uh, Zaire, and two Ebola vaccines, the ones made by Merck and Janssen, uh, into late-stage development and procurement. We're hoping uh, for licensure of one of those products within the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, and they, but the, it will represent a stockpile of products uh, that the American public uh, could, could rest assured that we will have at bay if there is ever a Dallas-like incident uh, in the United States again. But also we fully recognize that that's uh, far, you know, several months, if not years, behind where those products needed to be and when they needed to be there. 
So our top uh, priority in terms of research and development priorities uh, is to address those red sections of the wheel, right? Those are, it's viral hemorrhagic fevers, Ebola Sudan, Marburg, and then the chemical threat agents. So the chemical threat agents, those include vesicating agents like mustard gas, <coughs> it includes chlorine, it includes nerve agents, and it also includes pharmaceutical-based agents. Uh, think of a more concentrated fentanyl as, or an aerosolized fentanyl as uh, what those agents represent. And so we're really looking to leverage, unfortunately, off of the opioid epidemic in terms of trying to take products that may be improved versions of Narcan and, uh, and, and maybe perhaps purchasing and stockpiling those in the event that you know, these agents are becoming more popular. Uh, you know, car fentanyl and others are being kind of smuggled in from China on a regular basis for illicit use. It's not a bridge too far to think somebody couldn't mass produce these for, for other purposes as well. Uh, we're also very interested in repurposing products uh, to treat radiation injuries. Our uh, program director of our Rad Newt group, Mary Homer, has done a lot of work uh, kind of re-baselining the thinking around radiation injury in specific animal models. And she's found that uh, she thinks that there's a, a, a defect of a coagulopathy that's occurring in these various models. And so we're very interested in testing both pro and anticoagulant uh, products or well as uh, products that would inhibit vascular leak as a kind of a, a, a potential therapy and a potential underlying ability to treat an underlying mechanism of injury that we think is occurring uh, in radiation injury. Uh, antibiotic resistance is a huge issue. It's one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think antibiotic rep resistance represents an ex existential threat to our society. I do. And I, I think it's as bad as climate change. And I don't want to get into a political discussion here. But um, I, you know, it, as we continue to, to lose uh, antibiotics uh, to resistance, uh, we, can, we will continue to erode the efficiency of our modern medicine. And if we don't have modern medicine, then I can't respond to a bioterrorism event. Uh, if you get botulism and get put on a ventilator and then you get hospital-acquired pneumonia with an acinetobacter strain, then I didn't really do much to help protect you from, from botulism. So that kind of underpins everything we do. And so we're also very keenly, agent, keenly interested in getting new antibacterial agents on board, particularly new and novel classes. Uh, there's been about a 50-year innovation gap in terms of developing new classes of antibiotics for gram-negative agents, and we would like to really resolve that. And then just, you know, more effective, sustainable solutions are all things that we're continually interested in. I'm going to walk through each one of these kind of threats very quickly. I've already mentioned some of this, but, you know, for anthrax, we've got a vaccine that's stockpiled. We've got a next generation vaccine that we procured under Project BioShield in fiscal year 16. This is uh, Nuthrax with emergent biosolutions. It's getting us from a three dose current anthrax vaccine to a two dose vaccine. Uh, and so that really represents the benchmark for further development. If you can get us to a one dose vaccine, then that might be worth investing in. But if you have another two dose vaccine, then it's probably not gonna be of a lot of interest to us because of the money that we've already uh, gone into the development and procurement of those products. We've got multiple antibiotics. We've got three different antitoxin products. So the future for this area is really largely looking at sustainment, unless you have some sort of transformational solution. And, and if you do, we'd love to hear from you. For botulism, uh, we actually owned a gigantic horse herd at one point, and those are actual pictures of those horses. They were big draft horses. You think of them, they're larger than Clydesdales. Uh, you know, they're, they're basically, they come up to like here, at least for somebody who's 5'8". But we got licensed a product in 2013 called HBAT, which was the plasmapheresis of those horses. Uh, and it's the heptavalent botulism antitoxin. And it's been FDA approved. It's used routinely in foodborne outbreaks. Uh, there was actually a, a recent outbreak in a prison. Uh, how many of you ever heard of Pruno? Nobody? So in prison, they, they ferment their own wine. Uh, and they do that through a number of different ways, using fruit juice and all sorts of stuff, and their pruno was contaminated with botulism, and, and that product was deployed most recently for that. Um, but the product is capable of treating all seven serotypes of botulism. We have a stockpile of plasma that will get us for a certain period of time. I'm not gonna say how long that's going to be, but we really are, aside from sustainment, actually looking for a next-gen solution here. Uh, we really don't want to start back up another horse farm if we don't have to. Uh, we think that that might be part of the solution, but we really would like to move on to maybe more 21st century technologies that, um, like monoclonals or anything else. I don't want to predispose a solution here. But if you have a solution that gets us 
you know, uh, beyond maybe a polyclonal solution that gets us to a, uh, a solution that gets us to all seven serotypes, we'd be interested in hearing from you. Uh, I mentioned massive stockpiles of vaccine for smallpox. We've got an FDA, uh, uh, an antiviral drug submitted for FDA approval. Uh, there is still a need for a second antiviral. Um, the Institute of Medicine in 1999 recommended that before they would entertain the, dis dis the, the discussions of destroying the two stocks of variola, the ones at CDC and the one at Vector at Russia, we needed two different antiviral drugs with different mechanisms of action. And uh, we currently have one that has gone into the stockpile, but we're still looking for that second drug and are still supporting another drug, but there's probably a need for a few more shots on goal there. So if you have interest in that, please let us know. In terms of threat agents, in terms of bacterial threats, we've got a large stockpile, but I will just mention that, you know, I think there's a huge need for the continued development of new antibiotics. Uh, we've made uh, a number of different investments uh, over the last eight years in this space. Uh, we got our first antibiotic uh, approved in August of 2017. This is a drug called Vabomir. It's a combination of meropenem plus varbobactam. It's a uh, beta-lactamase inhibitor, beta-lactam combination that is really intended to treat multi-drug resistant gram-negative infections. Uh, and so this is something we were very excited about. We also, uh, just before the end of the year, uh, our, another partnership that we have with a company called Acaeogen, who's it's out of uh, South San Francisco, is developing a product called Plazomyosin, which is a next generation aminoglycoside, also meant to treat things like carbapenem resistant enterobacteria ACA, some of the most severe gram negative infections. They submitted their new drug application to the FDA. We also have another partner, uh, Tetraphase, uh, out of Boston, who was developing a drug called aravacycline, also meant to treat severe drug-resistant gram-negative infections, and they've also submitted their NDA uh, before this year. So we're hopeful uh, for two more approvals in our antibiotic space uh, next year. And um, what we're seeing is that, you know, we really are starting to graduate out of our antibiotic portfolio, these kind of later stage candidates. And there's also this recognition that those candidates that are graduating out um, were perhaps a conservative perspective on our investment in the sense that they're all precedented classes of existing antibiotics. And they're really not going, we're not going after hard enough, in my opinion, trying to resolve this innovation gap of truly novel approaches and novel classes, uh, specifically for gram negative agents. So I think I'm trying to instill the, into the Chris Houchins who runs our current program that we maybe need to be a little bit more risk tolerant in kind of the second phase of our, of our five year investment strategy, which is coming up. So, be on the lookout for that. But as part of that, we established, and this Tyler Merkley, I think, came here last year to talk a lot about CARBEX, and I'm happy to provide an update. But we, we recognized uh, when we were uh, re rolling out the national strategy to combat antibiotic-resistant bacteria that there's just handing out grants and just giving contracts wasn't going to be sufficient to really move the needle forward in terms of innovation in this space. And so we spitballed the idea of, of, you, of a totally different type of partnership and what came out of that you know, discussion and it got into the national strategy and we went in, in July of 2016 and awarded CARBEX, uh, which BART is contributing $250 million over the next five years to. Uh, and we've partnered with our friends at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease who are contributing $50 million in preclinical services. And our friends uh, in the UK with the Wellcome Trust who are contributing, I believe, about either 155 or 168 million over five years. Uh, and, in sum, has created uh, the world's largest public-private partnership dedicated to antibiotic development. And so right now, this chart is outdated because it changes like weekly, but we've uh, got 22 companies uh, in the portfolio that we're investing. Many of them are novel targets. Many of them are what I call non-traditional approaches, so looking at phage or license or you know, non-Fleming-based uh, antibiotics. Uh, and, and, we're in, and, and multiple kind of new classes of antibiotics. And so we're really excited about this partnership uh, uh, and we're hopeful that we can continue. We're already seeing the initial programs. Uh, it's this focus of this program is on kind of lead op through first time in human. We're already getting our first candidates into first time in human testing. So we're already meeting the successful metrics and the idea is that they will graduate out, hopefully be positioned for private sector investment uh, or, or a follow on uh, BARDA contract and award. And I would just say the companies that have entered into this, um, real briefly, are the cachet of being part of this has leveraged private sector investment. And so it looks like basically the estimates that we have is about every dollar that we've put in has been leveraged sevenfold uh, by private sector investment. And companies have just basically gotten a CARBEX award and then gone out and did their Series A or Series B financing. So that's really what we like to see. 
So for radiation, I mentioned we have these capabilities uh, with stockpiled cytokines and biodisymmetry devices, but there are other areas of injury that we also think are very important. Uh, in addition to uh, losing your neutrophils, you also lose your platelets, so there's a thrombocytopenia that needs to be addressed, and we've made some investments with a few companies but are eager to do more. Getting the biodisymmetry devices to be more field-friendly and, and point of care, and then also evaluating products in the context of this kind of coagulopathy defect that we're, we're seeing is something that it would be uh, of importance to us. So thermal burns is also an area of interest. Um, and FY fiscal year 2015, we awarded four programs under Project BioShield for burn technologies. One was uh, a dressing called Silverlawn, which is a silver impregnated dressing. Uh, normally, uh, the the silver diazine cream was used, and that if you ever use Noxema, it's like a, you know, the beauty cream. It's kind of the, the texture of that, and you have to remove it two or three times a day. And so you can imagine if you had 25% of your body burned, that might hurt. So we developed, this, we partnered and developed this other silver impregnated dressing that you don't have to manipulate the patient as frequently <laughs> with. We also developed a technology that's an enzymatic debridement technology with a company called MediWound. It's called Nexobrid. And this is a, uh, it's an enzyme derived from pineapple that basically degrades the necrotic tissue and eliminates the need for surgical debridement of the wound. And so in an emergency setting as well, it, it doesn't require the training that a burn surgeon has to be able to administer this product, which I think is of value. We also invested in a company called uh, Avita for a product called Resell, which is an autograph sparing technology. Uh, this basically, normally the, one of the most painful parts of getting burned is the actual removal of the donor graft. Uh, and this allows us to take 1 80th the normal size of that graft. And, and it dissolves it in a group of growth factors and it's a spray that then gets sprayed on and it has comparable clinical outcomes to just autographing alone. So we think this is really a great technology and also if any time you can min minimize the disruption to the patient, we think it's important. And we're also developed, we have also developed a with a company called Stratatech, an artificial skin substitute that basically removes the need to do a graft. You can just grow the skin in a, in a Petri dish and then use it. So we're also excited about that. Uh, we've advanced those, all three of those products into pediatric clinical testing uh, this last year, uh, which we also think is very important to have these products at ready for special populations like pediatrics. And we're also in inter in interest, interested in technologies that can help temporize wounds as well as imaging technologies that can help aid surgeons in effective debridement. For Ebola and VHFs, I mentioned that we awarded the two monoclonal antibody cocktails and the two vaccines in fiscal year 17. So that's just for Ebola Zaire though, and we have all of those needs for Ebola Sudan, and we have all of those needs for Marburg. So if you wanna make a vaccine or if you wanna make a therapy for one of those agents, uh, come talk to us, we would be interested in that. Nerve agents is one of the most, and all of the chemical agents are the most challenging set of agents that we have to deal with. Uh, when you basically get a nerve agent, it almost starts working instantaneously, uh, as was seen with Kim Jong-un's half-brother in the Malaysia airport. It didn't take long for him to die. It was about an hour. Um, so there's a couple things we did. One is we also view knowledge as a medical countermeasure, and so we worked on developing a scientifically informed decontamination guidance for first responders, and it's called the PRISM guidance, and you can look it up. But one of the interesting things that we saw was that, or that we, that we found is that if, if you suspected exposure to a nerve agent and you removed all of your clothes, you eliminated 95% of your risk of, of coming down with seizures. So, you know, I don't know if you saw a group of people taking off their clothes in the middle of the street. I don't know if you'd want to run toward it or away from it, but based on this, you would go the other way. Uh, so that also we've stockpiled midazolam, which is the drug they give you when you get a colonoscopy so you don't remember it. The, uh, and, it's, and it's basically a enhanced benzodiazepam that prevents the seizures. Uh, we're also interested in other, like not everybody, and it depends on how much nerve agent you've gotten, how long you've gotten it before we're able to get to you. Some seizures are going to be refractory with treatment of benzodiazepams and refractory to treatment of midazolam. And so there are other seizure drugs that are out there that work on different uh, neurological pathways uh, that we are also interested in supporting uh, and thinking about. Uh, for example, we've generated some very interesting data with ketamine. Uh, which is an anesthetic, and when you combine it with midazolam, at least in rats, we've shown that you limit the neurological injury that occurs after prolonged exposure to, to sarin. For mustard and chlorine, we need countermeasures for this agent. Uh, these are really difficult uh, kind of pleiotropic injuries. Uh, when you inhale chlorine, it basically turns your lungs, in turns, inside of your lungs, to basically a hydrochloric acid bath. 
And so you can imagine how difficult that would be to uh, treat that. Uh, but we've made a few partnerships, uh, namely uh, this last fiscal year we partnered with GSK around a drug that was meant for the treatment of pulmonary edema after cardiovascular failure uh, and have generated some very interesting data in animal models for uh, chlorine lung injury. So we are focused on repurposing and, and leveraging commercial markets where possible, so those would be uh, areas that we would be highly interested in. We want to be making a heavy investment in this space in the next two to three years with a, a focus on transitioning products uh, as soon as possible into Project BioShield. Lastly, cyanide is also an issue. This is also one that's really, really tough because once you inhale cy you know, cyanide binds to your terminal electron acceptor and inhibits oxygen from doing its thing, so you can imagine how quick that results in death. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we're focused on is just internasal delivery of things. We've generated some very interesting data with an isoamyl nitrate and an internasal formulation where we've been able to bring uh, animals back from, from near death. Uh, and so we're also interested if you have different technologies that would help address this uh, in, 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 in supporting those. So we, in general, challenges that we face, sustainment, sustainment of the enterprise. The more stuff we buy, the more money we need to keep buying it. Uh, or eventually companies won't think it's reliable and we're not a reliable partner and then they won't want to make it. So that goes hand in hand with maintaining an industry base. We've got a thin pipeline in some of these areas. Most people aren't interested in developing a medical countermeasure for mustard gas. So uh, trying to figure out clever ways to develop products that we think would treat that injury, uh, but hopefully maybe have a commercial market is really where we're trying to focus. Uh, we've invested a bunch in uh, these Ebola countermeasures, and, the, and right sitting on all of their critical path is, a, uh, is the amount of BSL-4 laboratory we have to do those experiments. So we're interested in also talking to people who have those facilities to see if there are ways that we can partner in a way that works out for everybody and allows us to keep our programs on track and on the critical path. And also I mentioned appropriation. That goes hand in hand with supplemental appropriations to emerging infectious disease outbreaks. But it also goes to the fact that, you know, our Project BioShield funding is given out annually. So I got $500 million, $530 million this year. I can't tell you how much I'm going to get next year. And if I can't tell you how much I'm going to get next year, that makes me really not a very good partner. So, uh, and if that's just decided by Congress, then that's, that's not dependable. And especially when I'm purchasing things that your, your boards are relying that I do, then it needs to be, it needs to be consistent. We're supporting animal models for the development of Ebola and other VHFs. Uh, we're supporting animal models to, to repurpose chemical and radiological agents. I mentioned that. And then we're also very interested in anything that's going to enhance the sustainment of the inter enterprise and lower what I call life cycle costs. So one of the things, for example, uh, that we've done, I won't name the company here, but we put a milestone into a company's contract where we said, we'll give you $50 million if you get eight years of expiry. No, no normal pharmaceutical developer would want to get eight years of expiry, but we put a little bit of a carrot out there that was worth it to them to do it. And so now, uh, you know, over a decade, we're going to save $700 million uh, for the U.S. government by making a $50 million investment. And those are the kind of things that we would like to structure and push companies to do wherever we can. Uh, so we've successfully developed a number of different countermeasures. We've got a number of different products licensed, but our work is far from complete and we need your help to, to get there. Uh, sustainability of what we've done so far remains a challenge. We're going to need to have a commitment uh, and, and the political will to maintain these investments, because so if, if not, it's kind of all for naught. Uh, and we will continue uh, to seek the type of flexible and nimble partnerships with you all uh, that have made the last 10 years or 12 years of BARDA uh, the success that it's been. And so uh, thank you for that. One couple quick plugs. So there's a lot of old people that work at BARDA, but we also want to try to get a few young people in too. Uh, and so we're trying to bring some early career scientists into BARDA to, to kind of increase our age diversity. And so this year I began a, an ORISE fellowship program at BARDA. This is really targeted at recent PhD grads or one or two years of postdoc. Uh, it's a one-year fellowship with a year that could be extended, so it's basically a two-year fellowship. If you know anybody that might be interested in something, we don't have an announcement out because we just the, the new crop of our three fellows just started on Monday. But um, if you want to reach out to me, my email's there, or Pam Payne, who uh, runs the program for us, we'd happy to get you more information or, and tip you off when a future announcement might be. So here are all the different ways that you can contact us. Uh, there's certainly the portal to uh, a, a resource that's called TechWatch. We have the ability for any company at any moment in time to schedule a meeting to come talk to us. Our door is always open, as they would say. Uh, there's also Fed BizOps. There's also uh, uh, USA Jobs if you're interested in coming working at BARDA. Uh, but 
probably the most efficient way is that is the top email address and phone number. Uh, that's mine. And if you want to just send me an email or contact me, uh, I'll be happy to direct you to the right person in BARDA to answer any of your questions or answer them myself. So I thank you for your time. Uh, appreciate it. Could you comment on uh, TRLs and the uh, degree to which the technology should be commercializable prior to uh, applying for the So I'm going to give you the answer as it stands right now, and then also caveat that with it may be a little bit different in a few weeks. Okay? So as it stands right now, for many of the programs that we have, it's it's you know it is basically an IND submitted, and 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 in some instances we'd like to see maybe even a little human data. And, and that's for areas that are more advanced. So for like our antibiotic program, we would want to see a, an IND and maybe even some initial phase one data because most of the programs that we're focused there are almost exclusively in their clinical development. Kind of the same for our vaccine programs, I would say. Uh, for areas where there's a little bit of a thinner pipeline, like in chem and in our rad nuke program, we've uh, made some exceptions there, uh, recognizing that we need to reach down and kind of pull some of those technologies up. We also don't do that as much for the bio programs because that's really the role of NIH with NIAID and they're making substantial investments in this space and so we kind of rely on them to try to get those products up into that appropriate stage of development. And that being said, we have new leadership. Uh, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response is a man by the name of Bob Cadlick and he's, uh, he's taken on, he's very pro barda he's very supportive of what we're doing. One of the things he said is he wants to make sure that the R in BARDA stands for research and he really wants to promote innovation in the type of technologies that are supporting. And so that we're undergoing a reorganization now, but one of the things that's talked about is that standing up an entire division that is focused more on disruptive technologies, earlier stage stuff. And so it could very well be, after, and, and the dust hasn't settled on any of this yet, but it could very well be in the next few months that there's a, a division that's more focused on funding kind of earlier stage, more high risk ventures. Yes. Is the BARDA cooperating with the FDA so there are incentives as vouchers for the treatment for treatment? So a very good, uh, you know, award for whoever developed something? Yeah, yeah. So the question was about uh, incentives and cooperation with the FDA. So I'll do the incentives last, cooperation first. So yeah, we regularly talk to the FDA both with the companies that we support and in some instances without in terms of there are overarching challenges with the development aspect of a specific program and we have agreements with FDA to exchange information across kind of the lines of HHS in a confidential way and it's been exceedingly helpful of kind of reducing and cutting down some of the, the regulatory barriers that may have existed but once we kind of get to the data we are able to overcome them. The incentive piece that you talk about is part of the 21st century cures legislation and there's a, a component in there that says for medical countermeasure development, if you're the first indication is for a medical countermeasure indication for one of these threat agents, that you're issued a priority review voucher. And this priority review voucher has been used for, I think, neglected diseases and, and pediatric orphan diseases. And it basically gives you a, a period, a, a condensed review, so that in, and if you were in a situation where you had a competitor that was pretty neck and neck with you, it would be a significant advantage because it would allow you to enter into the market first. Uh, historically, these have sold between uh, 700 or 75 million and 350 million. You know, it was kind of the top, and then kind of more the average is around 125 million. Uh, and the effect of this, I think, is going to be interesting. I think we're, we're fully supportive of any incentive that keeps companies engaged in wanting to do this. So let me be very clear about that. I think it's, it's, it's always interesting when new incentives are introduced what their effect is on the market. You know, something very similar was the GAIN Act of 2012 for antibiotics. And that's had like an effect, but it hasn't really had the profound effect that I think its designers entailed. And similarly, if we, you know, I hope that we're this successful that this, this becomes a problem, but what, you know, they've kind of shown that if the more and more that you introduce of these into the market, the less valuable they become. And so, and it kind of breaks down at around four. So we'll, we'll see, but I think one of the ones that the smallpox antiviral that we've developed, uh, who's, who's gonna be, have a regulatory decision this year, they would be the perfect uh, case study in, in watching what happens with this, because they, they would receive one. Yes? How much uh, effort is being put into uh, research and development of antibiotics and how much effort is 
Excellent point. Uh, we are interested in kind of preventative technologies as well. Uh, a lot of our programs, there's still kind of a push though for us to have a tie back to these bio threat agents that we've dealt with. And we've, we've tried to extend that narrative to saying like, well, hey, if a nuclear bomb goes off, you know, and people are neutropenic, they're gonna need all, all sorts of different antibiotics to protect them. But it's still trying to tie it back to our core mission of that. So disinfectants, you know, it, it might be a bridge too far for that. The, you know, but vaccines are certainly something that we're interested. We've gotten uh, our initial vaccine award for staff uh, through our CARBEX program that we're really excited about. We've also invested in a, a lung scope that can rule out bacterial or viral pneumonia within 30 seconds. And so those are, those are the type of technology, you know, and also I think going forward, I think we really want to start making a little bit more of a footprint in the diagnostic space particularly rapid point of care diagnostics to do pathogenic identification, antibodies, antibiotic susceptibility testing, ruling out viral or bacteria to really get us away from just blunt empiric use of antibiotics and trying to marry the technologies up to some of the other technologies that are being developed, which are largely kind of narrow spectrum antibiotic therapies. Um, so all good points. I think disinfectants might be a bridge too far out of our, you know, people have also asked us, why are we not doing mosquito control for things like Zika? And it's, we, we have a certain set of expertise in our organization, and we're very sensitive to not going off and doing things that we don't have any expertise in. Yeah. What's uh, your funding and procurement policy as it relates to things that either already have FDA approval, in other words, they don't need FDA approval, but have a specific uh, use, uh, or, uh, or, or uh, you know, things that, that they generally regard as safe, but where there is a potential application. <laughs> yeah. So the closest example to that that we've done are the cytokines that I mentioned for radiation. So these are Neupogen, Neulasta, and Leukine that are all FDA approved for, you know, treatment of neutropenia following chemotherapy. Uh, we've gotten two of those products FDA approved for the treatment of acute uh, radiation exposure. The other one submitted an SBLA uh, this year, and we should hear something probably in the first quarter. But for those, we actually don't stock, like, so the series of sites where we stockpile stuff is called the Strategic National Stockpile. And there's about nine sites around the United States that are just gigantic warehouses that hold all these products. Uh, but for those products, because they're commercial and they're still in routine clinical use, we didn't use that model. So we use something that we call vendor managed inventory. So we approached Amgen and Sanofi and we said, hey, we're gonna pay you a certain amount of money. And in exchange, we want a certain level of these cytokines to constantly be in your inventory that are, that are ours. And then if something happens, we have the right to go get them and deploy them immediately. And then as you need to use stuff for your clinical use, it rotates out of inventory and then you backfill it, but there's always that bubble of inventory. And that has been a really uh, successful way to, to do that because it doesn't involve us you know, necessarily taking ownership or you know, shipping the product to all these different sites. Uh, and it allows the, to be more commercially sustainable because it's still being rotated out for commercial use. And so for things that have robust commercial markets, uh, that's probably the way that we would envision procuring and sustaining those products. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging when something's in commercial use but maybe not widespreadly, you know, not used in a widespread way. Uh, there's a couple, there's another deal that we're actually doing right now that I can't talk about, which is another kind of interesting uh, way that we're leveraging off of a commercial product. So maybe I can come back next year and tell you about it. How do you think about uh, so we're developing something successor to the Ubergen the last detector? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so we can go commercial and focus on chemo, and that's the thing we're going to do to focus on your application. How do you think about Go commercial. Go commercial. 
and then, and then, then come talk to us, you know? And, and we love competition, right? We love competition because it drives down price, but then like the rub of competition is that we have to have enough money to be able to support multiple companies. And if like, you know, and if we have a requirement for, you know, 100,000 and we divide that by five and that's not sufficient for anybody to want to participate. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic because, um, it's a monotony. Like we're the only we're the only buyer. So it's a it's a it's a creates a weird dynamic that we have to also constantly. So competition is good, but it also can be bad if you don't have enough money to support both people who are making those the products. You know. Yeah. yeah but, but go commercial, then come back and talk to us. We want sustainable products. All right. Yeah. It's. Right there. Yeah, sorry. That was me. <laughs> All right, anybody else? All right, I'll be around. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you just mentioned Foblin, and, and last year we paid for many three, four times Foblin. What about the global cooperation? Yeah. But maybe we do a lot of news to that. So we, we, we cooperate globally on another, a, a number of fronts. Um, you know, for antibiotic resistance, for example, I'm part of the Transatlantic Task Force on Antibiotic Resistance, and that's us, UK, EU, Norway, Canada, and we get together and, and prioritize uh, you know, specific projects to try to coordinate uh, MIC breakpoints, you know, the way that we, uh, you know, think about coordinating our R&D investments. Uh, there's also the Innovative Medicines Initiative program out of the EU that's part of a collaboration between the EU equivalent of pharma and their uh, government that supports a number of different, they have a clinical trial network called Comeback Care. Uh, we actually, through a partnership that we now have with Pfizer, are, are doing the phase three clinical trial of an antibiotic called this Trianam Avibactam. And we're covering all the U.S. and non-EU clinical studs, and the IMI program is covering all of the EU sites. So it's a nice way that we're able to leverage their existing clinical trial network to reduce kind of our costs. Um, you know, for Ebola and a number of other things, we were at the, the larger international community table in terms of coordinating uh, this clinical trial that we did for an Ebola vaccine called STRIVE. Um, we're also... Uh, Recently, there was a paper that just came out in Lancet that was the WHO's priority list of antibiotic-resistant pathogens. Uh, a number of different U.S. government people, but also uh, a BARDA personnel member was involved in collaborating with WHO and deriving uh, that list. Uh, uh, Carbex is a, another great example of uh, where we're partnering with our friends in the U.K. And we've actually reached out uh, to a number of different countries uh, because Carbex represents a global public-private partnership, and there anybody, any country who wants to contribute and invest in innovative approaches to, to solving AMR is willing to contribute. Um, and there's a few more. I'm hopeful in the next year or two we might be able to announce a couple other countries that are going to join, so which we're absolutely thrilled about. Um, the CBRN space is a little more difficult. You know, we are the elephant in the room in terms of buying products for things like anthrax and smallpox. A lot of other countries just don't view the threat as the same as we do. And, uh, and so their investments in this space are, are commensurate with that perspective. And so it's difficult to collaborate if people aren't contributing resources and are doing stuff. But, uh, but yeah, we try our best to, to be plugged into the global community. We think it's of absolute importance. Okay, I'll be around all day. So if anybody has any questions, uh, just stop on by. So thank you.